Hi everyone, my name is Steph, this is The Novelty Corner and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today I have a Books Beside My Bed video for you where I wrap up the last seven days worth of reading. This week we are going to be talking about nine things, so settle in, get comfy. We are going to jump straight in with a young adult title that I received for a review from Alan and Unwin. It does release this week and that is Deep is the Fen by Lily Wilkinson. This was an utter delight to read. It is a YA fantasy. It is set in a world that is recognisably ours, but at the same time it is also very different. We are following Mary who is a young girl who has grown up with her two best friends. They've spent their entire life together and it is their last summer before they go their separate ways. Sol is leaving for college, Mary has a scholarship for college in another town, and Teddy who is the boy that she has had a crush on for the longest time, even though she told him that he was never allowed to fall in love with her, is staying in the town and becoming one of the Toadmen. The Toadmen are a secret society of men only who uphold some pretty dated thinking but also dabble in dangerous magic. Magic in this world is tightly controlled and if you do anything outside of that you can be caught, captured and rehabilitated and all of those people are women who people claim to be witches. And when Teddy signs up with the Toadmen, Mary is determined to stop him from being inducted into that secret society, which means she needs to team up with her high school nemesis, Caraway, who comes from a very wealthy family. And he is also a member of the Toadmen, but he is trying to cut off ties with them. And so he offers to help her with her quest if she helps him with his. And the two end up at an ancient Toadman ritual in Deeping Fen, which is kind of like a magical bog. And secrets come pretty hard and fast about Caraway's connection to the Toadman, Mary's involvement in this ritual, and who or what the Toadman actually are and why they are taking people's magic. For the majority of the book, you feel like Mary is constantly on the back foot because people keep double crossing her in all sorts of ways. She has to be pretty quick on her feet in order to overcome what is happening around her. I have to admit the first couple of pages I wasn't quite sure how I was going to feel about this book and then I sped through the rest of it. It was just very immersive. I don't know why I doubt it because it's Lily Wilkinson. Her books are just really cleverly crafted and it's fantasy but it feels real and I appreciate that because that helps keep me grounded in it because I'm, I'm not so great on the completely totally different world. There's enough similarities in here for it to center the story almost like an urban fantasy. And I love the dynamics between all of the teens in this story and how they are finding where they fit and their place and they make mistakes like teens do because they don't have all the information and they think that they do. And I also liked the hate to love relationship that develops between Mary and Caraway throughout the story. So highly recommend. This comes out this week. I love this cover even though it's creepy as all get out. All right, then I read Why You Should Read Children's Books Even Though You Are So Old and Wise by Catherine Rundell. This is a very short little essay about why you should read children's books and it is beautifully written. There are so many incredible little quotes and things that you can pull out of it but mostly it upholds that idea that children's literature has incredible value and is not just for kids and that yes some books are written just for children but there are so many things that we as adults can learn from picture books and kids fiction and I read it a couple of times just because it's so beautifully written and it's so and it so closely mirrors my own feelings towards children's literature and I just absolutely loved it like it's a super super short little thing but worth checking out if you're interested like I, I cannot understate how many gorgeous quotes there are in this book. Then I completed the Executive Office series by Tal Bauer which meant reading Enemy of My Enemy and Enemy Within and these are books two and three in the series and it means I'm now I've now completed it although I did find out that there are two books that are connected to this one that I will be reading because of course I will. So the Executive Office series is a romantic suspense relationship between the President of the United States and his lead Secret Service agent and book one and the bridging novella between book one and book two deal with sort of them establishing that relationship, it coming out in the media and also Ethan who is the Secret Service agent having to make a decision about whether to stay in his position or to become the first gentleman. There's also a lot of political maneuvering and threats of war and a US traitor general involved in that first book which is essentially what these two books are because yes Ethan and Jack are in their relationship, people know about it, people are not happy about it. That's, that continues to happen in here. They are they are rock solid and there is uh, there was a plot that I, I don't know why it needed to be in there but I also 
understand why it was. And if you've read the series, you know, you know. But mostly this really looks at how the two of them and their new political ally, the president of Russia, are working to undermine the group of individuals who are trying to blow up the world, quite literally. It is a super intense series. I actually read them back to back in the same day. Don't, don't ask. It was, it was a day. And for me that worked, but I can see why that wouldn't work for other people because it is super intense. Like a lot happens in all of these books. And I did have to sit there with my phone and Google Maps for pretty much every time they change location going, where on earth are we? It was like playing Carmen San Diego <laughs> with characters in the book. Because a significant portion, particularly of Enemy Within, takes place in Russia, through Siberia and in the Arctic Circle. So I've learned how close some countries really are to each other, which I knew but hadn't made that connection. But yes, the whole thing is very tense because the world is literally on the brink. I mean, these would make an amazing TV series or movie. Like, they were just that kind of intensity. I also read A House with Good Bones by T. Kingfisher. This was an audiobook that I got out from Libby and it is about Sam who is an entomologist and a project that she was working on has been postponed so she's come home and she's staying with her mum in her grandmother's old house and strange things begin happening like ladybugs appearing or covering her entire room in the middle of the night and she's constantly cutting her skin on rose thorns in the garden and she has these really disturbing memories of her grandmother and the way that she treated her but also how she threatened Sam and her brother with the underground children and ultimately this story is very much a horror kind of story and Sam and her mum and some of the other people in the street where she lives get caught up in the history of this house that has its own sort of sordid magical history with her grandparents and her great-grandparents and it was honestly at times kind of creepy but it does very much feel like a T. Kingfisher story in that it's accessible it, it doesn't push the horror elements so far that it's not accessible I don't think but it definitely is creepy so be aware of that but I had a great time reading it. I also reread Magic Slays by Lona Andrews I was listening to the graphic audio for this one because it came out a little while ago and I enjoyed myself immensely and this one Kate is trying to establish her new private investigative business Andrea comes back to town. It is the introduction of Escanio to the series and the return of Julie to town. And the major plot line is that there is an individual who has come up with a way of basically capturing magic in the environment and removing it completely. The purpose behind that was for him to be able to create a device that makes hospitals safe from the magic fluctuations because his wife died during a flare. But of course this has massive implications for the rest of the world because so much of the world has magic and when you suddenly suck magic out of everything, people die. So Kate and everyone around her are trying to stop this. And it's also the first time that Kate begins to use her magic in the way that Roland uses magic. So it is a really interesting story. Uh, we see that she is learning more about being the consort of the Beast Lord in that she has to manage internal pack conflicts and she outplays everyone because of course she does because we love her and she is just very unhappy with the way that people are trying to use her. Like all the books the big clash at the end ends up with characters dying. There's a lot of general violence and blood so be aware of that going into it but it was a great time and I really enjoyed the graphic audio for this one. I also read Romantic Puck Boy by Eden Finley and Saxon James. This is book six in the Puck Boy series. When I say I had the best time reading this story about idiots falling in love I mean it. I really do. This one has a connection to the Frat Wars series in that Miles is from that series. So he has a very frat boy mentality, but he's actually a total cinnamon roll of a character. Like he is the sweetest thing ever. He is a goalie who has been called up to the NHL for his first starting season. He makes friendship bracelets for his entire team. He has pet rocks that he talks to before his games. And he also names the net that he guards, Annette as in Annette, and talks to it during the game. He is precious and totally weird, and I kind of love him for it. And then you have Bilson, who is transferred from Seattle to Nashville, and he's kind of addicted to getting married. He's been married and divorced four times, and he wants out of the city because all of his exes are there, and he's trying not to marry anyone because he is addicted to love. Like, and part of it comes from not really having that kind of love relationship with his parents and he knows that and he knows he just wants to, you know, he, he doesn't want to just be with someone and fall in love with them and then marry them. And everyone, get, everyone teases him for it for obvious reasons. And anyway, he comes to Nashville and he and Miles become really fast friends because they both have the same maturity level 
despite the fact that Bilson is like seven years older than Miles, and they get along great. And both of them think that they're straight. They have a night of no strings attached sex. Then it becomes more than one night. And just seeing the, the development of their relationship and the fact that the two of them are idiots. Like, I, and I mean that in the nicest possible way. It takes them a while to figure out what exactly they're doing and their feelings for one another. But it was so good. We also get to see various members of the queer collective in this book which are the characters from both the CU Hockey World and also the Puck Boys universe, and it was delightful. I did receive an early copy of this book for review. It comes out on the 18th. Honestly, this series just brings me so much joy because it is just so light and fun. There's no third act breakup, and I just, I had the best time reading it. And then the last two books that I'm going to talk about are the last two books in the Desert Rose series by Mika James. So I read Being Cordial and Being Merry. And I have to say, I was kind of disappointed with these two books. And it's not because they weren't well written and it's not because I think the author did anything wrong. I just think it was the kind of story that wasn't for me. And I, for some reason, this is where I get myself into trouble when I don't read synopsises or I don't know what's going, what's happening in a book. I probably would not have read them if I'd known that, maybe. But part of me was going on the fact that I really do like Mika James's writing, so I was reading them essentially for that. Because both of them are hate to love or antagonistically hate to love stories. And I just didn't necessarily vibe with that. Like I, I love a good hate to love story as much as the next person, but I do think it can be really tricky to get the balance right in a contemporary romance story, especially novella length stories, because both of these books are under a hundred pages. So Being Cordial is about two neighbors in an apartment block. Our female protagonist has been harboring a grudge against the male protagonist because he swooped in and bought the apartment that she really wanted while she was weighing the pros and cons. And so she, in her head, she's just automatically assumed that he's not a nice guy. And straight away that, that bothered me because she decided to weigh the pros and cons and someone got in before her and that is perfectly valid. That's not his fault. So to hold a grudge against him for that, I think is a little bit unreasonable. And then they just, they don't speak except exchanging notes or when she gets cranky with the fact that he's got his music up loud. So she goes over and asks him to turn it down, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually they, they begin sleeping with one another and it's kind of begrudgingly and so on and so so forth. And I just, I don't know, it felt like the, the power balance in the story was a little bit weird. And the same thing happened in Being Merry, which is a sapphic story, because we have a pediatric psychologist who needs to find a place to stay. And so one of her co-workers says, hey, my sister's got a spare bedroom. Go and stay with her for, until you get your own place. But the friend hasn't told her sister any of this. And so our main character turns up and the sister is annoyed because she's a homebody and alone and she wants her own space, blah, blah, blah. And then we have one character who is obsessed with Christmas and the other who doesn't. And then there's a massive blow up about that. And I actually felt very uncomfortable in that, se in that scene in terms of their relationship. It's not that it's not a realistic situation because it is, but I don't know how their relationship progressed from there. I mean, it's not, it's not a life changing argument, but the way that, but the reaction and the way that one character doesn't actually consider the, the feelings of the other person is, is a bit weird. So am I glad that I finished the series? Yes, because I like finishing series and I and I genuinely do like Mika James's writing. I just, yeah, the type of story that it was, was not for me. And those are the books that I've read this week. In the comments, I would love to know if you have read any of these books, if you're planning on picking any of them up. Otherwise, feel free to share something you have been reading and loving this week. Or if you want to let me know that you're here, but you don't want to leave a comment, feel free to leave a frog emoji down below. I hope that wherever you are in the world, you're staying safe and healthy, and I will see you in my next video. Thanks so much for watching. Bye everyone.